Good evening and welcome to Hardfire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, and uh, I'm here with you for another half hour of news, current events, and politics from a libertarian perspective. With me tonight is my uh, guest, the libertarian candidate for lieutenant governor of the state of New York, Professor Donald Silberger. Um, and um, Dr. Silberger, maybe you can start by telling me, telling our viewers a little about what the Libertarian Party is, what it stands for, and how it differs from the Democrats and the Republicans. One important difference between our party and the Democratic and Republican parties is that we don't win. Okay. That's a, a difference which needs to be stressed somewhat more, especially to people in our party who think that the big job of our party is to win and to tell voters that we're aiming to do that. Win meaning gaining the jobs for which we are purportedly running. Okay, well, but uh, very briefly, does the Libertarian Party stand for anything in particular? Now, how does the Libertarian Party differ from the other parties that don't win? <laughs> the Libertarian Party stands for a live and let live mode of life. I don't bother you, I don't get in your way, I don't interfere with your habits, or your property, I don't try to dominate you, and you give me the same respect. Okay, well, uh, why is that uh, particular way of thinking not popular enough to get us elected? Uh, that way of thinking uh, is running counter to what has increasingly become an authoritarian streak in the American culture in which people depend upon government to take care of their needs, needs that they probably should expect to take care of themselves or have their families help them with, and they're willing to surrender their freedom in order to have those needs purportedly taken care of, at great expense, I might add. Of course, and at the same time, they demand that the rest of us surrender our freedoms so that they can be uh, taken care of as they wish. Exactly. And this leads, doesn't it, to a sort of criminalization of society as a whole. Uh, I mean, I have noticed that um, government seems more and more to be in the business of punishing people, especially fining them for the sake of revenue, and uh, putting people in jail for, uh, for looking at the wrong person the wrong way. That's a, a major issue in your campaign, is it not? More and more, that which is not mandated, which is not required of people, is prohibited. And more and more, it is assumed that if one is stopped by a policeman, it's justified, and if one is indicted for some crime, that this crime really is a crime simply because a collection of idiots who were put into position to make laws for other people have deemed it such. And consequently, the United States now jails, incarcerates, imprisons a larger percentage of its citizens and a larger number of its citizens than any other country on earth. Furthermore, the, both the percentage and the numbers are increasing. Jails are rapidly a building. Okay. And among, in, in a somewhat floppy economy, such as ours today, prison building is a growth industry. I find this uh, a, a startling phenomenon in our country. Somewhat more startling when one reflects upon it is that nobody seems to be talking much about this. No politicians do. None of those from the parties that expect to win to put people in a position to make laws that incarcerate their fellow citizens. Well, I can tell you why that is. It's because most people are just as glad to uh, see a large percentage of the population incarcerated, don't you think? Not convinced of that. I suppose it's, as long as it's other people and other kinds of people, well, well, yes. it doesn't bother them. Right. Um, you know, people who do drugs, um, the riffraff, um, people whose lifestyles are maybe a little different from one's own. People who sell things that actually, or rent things that actually belong to them, like their bodies. Quite, quite. So, um, under a libertarian administration, you seem to be implying there would be a lot fewer people incarcerated. There would be a lot fewer people incarcerated and there would be, in fact, a lot fewer laws, laws which from our point of view would be reasonable laws, laws which are designed 
to protect people's bodies, to protect their property, and not to protect them against offense, for example, from other people who behave in in decorous <laughs> in decorous fashions. Okay, very good. So, um, in other words, um, <laughs> what would be against the law in a libertarian society? A lot of people have the idea that libertarianism stands for a lawless society, but we don't, do we? Murder would be against the law. If there's common property, littering would remain against the law. Certainly littering my property would be against the law if it's somebody else littering it. Okay. Stealing would be against the law. Fraud would be against the law. Ripping off people's pension funds would be against the law. Okay, it sounds reasonable to me. But um, using drugs, selling drugs, that wouldn't be against the law, correct? Suicide would not be against the law. People own themselves. They have a right to do with themselves as they will if they're not infringing on the rights of other people. Well, suits me. So if one wants to ingest poison, it's stupid. One could try to convince a person not to do this if one has an opportunity by means of argument, by means of reason. One in a libertarian society would not be calling the police on this individual in order to prevent the individual from doing this. Okay, and I suppose you feel the same way about um, other so-called victimless crimes such as gambling, prostitution, um, so forth? Yes, in New York State, for example, gambling re isn't really against the law providing it's the state that's controlling the gambling and calling it the lottery and alleging that the money is being used for a good cause like education. So the enumerate are victimized, presumably for the benefit of the, of the many. Exactly so, and that uh, sort of contradicts the idea that the law is there to protect you against yourself. Yes. Now, if the government can run g gambling enterprises, why can't... In Private individuals engage in gambling, particularly... Well, because then it can't be taxed and regulated. Are you silly? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, now tell me, what would a libertarian system of criminal justice look like? Would there still be incarceration, for example? Incarceration is not necessarily the most reasonable way of handling offenses. If there are crimes, there are crimes against people or against people's property. The, due res the reasonable response to those crimes would be to compensate the people who were wronged. So the criminal, the person who wronged such an individual, ought to pay for that crime literally by compensating the individual for the harm caused to the, to the, to the extent possible. Obviously, if a murder has been committed, the murderer cannot restore life to the murdered individual but that murderer could be required to take care of the family of the murdered individual. Okay. To supply the economic wherewithal for that family. That would be an example. Okay. Thieves would return or be required to return the property or the value of the property stolen together with the expense of recovering that property. And the inconvenience of having been without it, I suppose. Precisely. Okay. Now, um, let me ask you this. An awful lot of people in this state in particular are in jail or prison because of crimes related to gun possession. What's the libertarian position on possession of firearms? The libertarian position on the possession of firearms is related to the libertarian attitude towards an individual's ownership of himself or herself. An individual's right to life, possession of self, implies that that individual has a right to defend that life, that self. That means that the individual has a right to the tools of self-defense. That is what modern firearms are all about. Modern firearms are also playthings for those who know how to use them safely, and I commend that sport. I participate in it. But the main issue is people should have power over themselves and over their own destinies to the extent possible. The police cannot be everywhere. And Even it should be pointed out that the police do not have an affirmative duty to protect you in any case. Precisely. They, are, they have an affirmative duty only to enforce the law, which is to say, 
to punish people, incarcerate people who have broken the law, whether the law is reasonable or not. Okay. You dial one nine one one and die characteristically. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Now there are an awful lot of people who call themselves liberals who say that the um, ownership of um, firearms should be severely restricted, maybe only to soldiers and police officers. What do you have to say to that? Uh, that has been the case certainly in Nazi Germany. Uh, my uh, relatives suffered grievously under that particular uh, edict and it turned me strongly against it. I maintain my strong stand against it largely for that reason. The 1938 Hitler law copied a 10 year earlier law passed in the Weimar Republic, adding the provision that mainly Jews should be deprived of firearms. And incidentally, the first important federal firearms law that came in 1968, I believe, after the assassinations of important figures in American society, largely copied the Hitler law okay, without, without the provision about Jews. Of course, I'll believe that. But um, it seems to me, I don't have the statistics at hand, but it seems to me that a huge percentage of the people who are incarcerated in this country, and in New York in particular, are there for drug-related offenses. Which accounts also for the violence which, uh, which the people who are deploring firearms ownership cite as a reason for restricting firearms. So many murders occur in the United States. Well, murders occurred principally in the United States during Prohibition. 1919 to 1932 or 33, and um, the murder rate dropped after that. It certainly did, and um, I think it uh, is not even arguable that um, the uh, drug prohibition laws lead to other types of crime. That's common knowledge, uh, and yet people, even people who call themselves social liberals, are adamantly against the decriminalization of drugs. It, why is that and what can we do about it? it I cannot understand why social liberals uh, are opposed to ending the drug war when it has so many obvious attendant evils and when it has accomplished so little, including little in the direction that it claimed uh, it wanted to accomplish. Drug use has gone up since prohibition of drugs has uh, been ushered in in 1914. That's right and that's something that a lot of people don't know that um, most drugs were not illegal until fairly recently, isn't that correct? I mean, you could, for example, get a bottle of heroin at the uh, pharmacist. Uh, in, the, in the early teens. That's right. And marijuana was basically unheard of by most Americans and was perfectly legal until 1937 when Harry Anslinger, a former pro alcohol prohibition cop, uh, decided that it was a good idea to maintain employment for himself and his kind and consequently uh, uh, the demon, not the demon rum, which was now legalized or at least controlled, it created a new devil, a devil mainly used by the underclasses, people from Mexico, people from uh, blacks in New Orleans, jazz musicians, people that Enslinger himself d despised. And he, in, in fact, pushed that law on the grounds that it, uh, it motivated the lower races to have sex with white women. Okay. That was, that, was his, that was his way of selling marijuana prohibition in 1937. Well, maybe it did, but that's not a point against it. <laughs> well, the more the pro prohibition is supported, the more there is a reason for gangs to develop, to take advantage of the huge profits which one would expect when there is a banned and desired entity. Okay, but what do you say to people who say, well, that sounds real good, but I've seen too many people just completely ruin their lives from, from taking drugs. We can't possibly legalize it. What do you say to that? Uh, people ruin their lives all the time over all sorts of things work, members of the opposite sex who do not return their affections or refer, return them too violently, all sorts of ways in which individual can destroy himself or herself. Why make a special case about drugs, especially since the problem has been increasing and more people have been ruining their lives 
with every escalation of the war against drugs. America mm -hmm. spends $3 billion a year to enforce the law, uh, war against drugs. 80% of federal prisoners are drug prisoners. I really had no idea that the percentage was that high. Yes. So my gosh, what are we going to do with all these fellows once we let them go? Well, what we're doing with them in jail apparently is uh, using them as slave labor. Well, yes, that's common knowledge also. 23 cents an hour is what these people are paid so they can buy cigarettes and drugs in jail, in prison, where it is possible to obtain these prohibited drugs that the government and other people who are enforcing the drug, law, drug war are telling themselves and the world that they're going to stop outside of prison wall, walls where presumably they have less control. And I have another suspicion besides the fact that there's a new way of enslaving blacks and Latinos who are in jail in enormous numbers compared well, to... Well, now let's not forget the poor white trash. We have people in, in jail in, in huge numbers from the underclasses, exactly. mainly for drugs or for the violence which is related to the drug war. Exactly so. It's Pe a matter of keeping the riffraff down regardless of race, I Pe submit. Pe people, can't, people can't find jobs, but they certainly can make a great deal of money selling material which is subsidized by the laws that elevate the prices by a, fact by a factor of, of sometimes a thousand. Of course, and if you were to decriminalize all these drugs, you would prices immediately would you would put the street dealers out of business because they would not be able to compete with uh, a Walgreens or a Dwayne Reed who could guarantee their product and sell it at a lower price. Now allow, myself, allow me to uh, wax a little paranoid about this if you don't mind. I, uh, it should be noticed that there is a rampant AIDS in the ghettos now. Where does this come from? Is it the immorality of people in that uh, area? That's what some people would argue. Okay. First of all, it's a breakup of family. Secondly, a large percentage of young blacks go to prison. Now, many of these individuals are defenseless, relatively nonviolent individuals who are subject to rape on a continuous basis in prison by people who are already infected with AIDS. What happens when these people get out of prison, these young men? They go back into their communities and they infect their girlfriends and their wives with AIDS. This certainly must be noticed. Why is it allowed to happen? Why is the policy that produces this massacre permitted to continue? Why does nobody challenge this aspect of it? Well, I suppose that it's because uh, there are people in power who would rather uh, have these people incarcerated as much as possible and be damned what happens to them after they get out. I'd like, to, I'd like to rail a little against my compatriots who are for more moderation in change. Let's not kill people in a cruel way. Let's kill them kindly, is the attitude. Medical marijuana. Now look, everybody that I've spoken with in the medical profession privately, and there have been a number, agree that Marijuana is useful for a number of conditions to control nausea that is incident to treatment by anti-cancer drugs, to eliminate anorexia associated also with this condition, to help spa people who are suffering from spasms in multiple sclerosis. Many conditions are aided by marijuana. Marijuana remains absolutely prohibited by the government, even when the states who under the Tenth Amendment have the right to make laws about this sort of thing for themselves and for their own citizens. The DEA from the federal government invades those states. Now why have the anti-marijuana laws become so draconian? Because I remember there was a time in the late 60s up until the 80s when they were becoming gradually more lenient and in many states marijuana was virtually legal as long as you were discreet about it. Since, since a a fair percentage of people, young people in particular, are aware that marijuana is a relatively innocuous material, if indeed it is harmful. It is certainly less harmful than legal alcohol. Probably, yes. I, it's, a, it's a mystery. 
why the suppression continues. Perhaps there is fear that if this particular lie is exposed and marijuana is legalized, basically legalized, then people will start looking at the other anti-drug laws as well. Now my own attitude is, of course marijuana should be permitted to patients under the prescription of, a, of physicians, but why should physicians control people's lives? Physicians are there as, as servants for people. Exactly so. so I, um, I wonder why we want to stop at, uh, at saying that. it should be a prescription drug. Why no, not? Let's, let's be clean about it. I say go back to 1914, repeal the Harrison Narcotics Act, get rid of it all, let people out of prison who have caused no harm to anybody else, and that's what I will do if I ever get elected to, <laughs> to be lieutenant governor. I will ask my boss, John Clifton, to appoint me to head a commission to examine prison sentences and those people who are in jail who have not done anything to anybody else that, that, that those other people will object to are out of jail, compensated for time served, or years of their lives that have been robbed from them. Okay, now I'll have to interrupt. Property it. restored to them. End it. Okay. Now, uh, just to be cantankerous, I'll ask you a, a standard libertarian question about compensating these fellows. At whose expense? It would come out of the agencies uh, whose budgets are stuffed by the drug war. That's the first place it would come. And those people obviously would suffer from uh, sudden unemployment. There's plenty of good work to be done in society so that they can continue to draw salaries for doing useful stuff cleaning up the garbage that everybody's throwing around because you can't buy anything in this country without having it stuffed into plastic and the plastic stuffed into plastic again, which plastic gets caught in hedges all over the country. Okay, that's, that's something that annoys me as well. Now, uh, when a libertarian administration takes over in Albany, what the heck are we going to do about that type of pollution? Well, that type of pollution, first of all, is trespass. And people have a right to protect themselves against trespass. And public property, if it makes any sense at all, is trespass on everybody. So people who are throwing garbage around should be obliged to pick up that garbage. And I, I, I like to think of people in clown suits going around for a day or two of public service picking up garbage publicly that other people have thrown around because they have been uh, arrested for throwing garbage. Okay, sounds like not too bad of an idea for, to me, but um, this business of um, sentencing people to community service of this kind might make sense when the person has actually committed a, a violation of some kind, but we see it also, don't we, in the public schools nowadays where kids can't graduate, can't get a high school diploma unless they have performed some sort of community service, whether they feel like doing it or not. Now, are you going to allow that to stand when, uh, when the Libertarian ad administration takes over? I mean, that sounds like kidnapping to me. It sounds like kidnapping to me. And indeed, while we're on the subject of kidnapping, every illegitimate arrest and incarceration is a kidnapping, should be seen as such, a kidnapping by a powerful force, a government. Carl Chessman was executed for kidnapping in California. Now, I think that's a, an excessive punishment for that particular crime, but on the other hand, some sort of compensation is due. Now, what about community service for people who are benefiting from the public dole in, in the schools? It is a form of, of incarceration of slavery. It is indeed, and it strikes me that it is a way for the government to impress on these children that they do not own themselves, that they are property of the state and they had bloody well better get used to it. All right, but let's, think, let's look at it from another angle. People who are doing community service are also purchasing their education. They're paying for it with their own labor. They're given an opportunity to labor to earn their education. Well, if they do it voluntarily, that's, uh, that's something. But uh, as I see it, if you put a child to uh, community service as a condition of graduation, you are basically holding his diploma hostage until he knuckles under to the whims of the state. Indeed, I think it probably should not be a condition of graduation, but might be a condition of uh, continued schooling. Okay. 
Well, now, uh, on the whole issue of public education, generally speaking, will you allow public education to go on under a libertarian administration, or will you alter it dramatically? I think that it's, uh, it deserves competition, that people who want to send their, their children to private schools should be able to send their children to private schools with the money that they contribute as taxes to support the public schools. Now, of course, a lot of people are supporting public schools who don't have children in any schools at all because they're out not, not, they don't have children or they're not the, the proper age. They're older, for example, and uh, the taxes are sometimes pretty heavy to support the public schools. And there seems to be uh, relatively little control, particularly if the state is mandating things that have to be done that raise the expenses without somehow paying for these uh, expenses. Okay. Well, now at this point, <clears throat> we have to um, start wrapping up our show. So I want you to tell our viewers, is there a, uh, a website they can go to to learn more about uh, your campaign and the campaign of our gubernatorial candidate, John Clifton? My website and John Clifton's website are identical this time. It's electclifton.org, www.electclifton.org. I ran for the Senate two years ago. If you want to find out something about me, you might try www.silbergerforsenator.org. That's great. That's terrific. Um, and I definitely want all of our viewers to check out that website. And on Election Day, November the 7th, get out to the polls. Vote for John Clifton for governor. Vote for Don Silberger for lieutenant governor. Elect the entire libertarian ticket. That's all for now. This is Joseph Dorian. Good night from Hardfire.